the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. The Russian Anarchists and the Treaty of Brest Litovsk by Geoffrey Swain. I want to begin with a little story. In early March 1918, the British intelligence agent George Hill met Marusia Nikiforova, the leader of the anarchist Black Guard in the Ukrainian town of Nikolaev and a close associate of Nesta Makhno. The meeting took place at a railway halt not far from Nikolaev, and Hill recalled a good-looking girl of 23 or 24 with dark hair, rather sensuous lips and a fine figure, who was dressed as a man in soldier's clothes and top boots and carried a revolver on each hip. It was hot in the railway carriage where they met, and Marussia unbuttoned her Russian blouse and quite unnecessarily exposed her throat and breast. I suddenly realised that the lady was making overtures to me. Well, this could have been just a bit of retrospective male fantasising, but why on earth was a British intelligence officer holding talks with a leader of the anarchist Black Guard? Hill was in Ukraine at the time the Treaty of brest was signed on 3rd March, and that treaty recognised Ukraine as an independent state, but a state whose declared independence would be guaranteed through occupation by German troops. Hill could see that it was in the interests of Britain and the Allies to try and encourage at least some fighting on the Eastern Front, and even minimal resistance to the Germans in Ukraine could delay the transfer of troops to France. The relevance of the meeting with Marussia and her Black Guard was that the Russian anarchists were also opposed to the Treaty of brest and the Black Guard was ready to confront the German occupiers. Of course, the anarchists had no interest in helping the Allied cause. They wanted to confront German imperialism for another reason. They wanted to internationalise the Russian Revolution. So this talk is about the anarchist response to the Treaty of brest and how the truce between the anarchists and the Bolsheviks came to an end. The anarchists and the Bolsheviks acted in parallel for much of 1917. They had the same response to the overthrow of the Romanov dynasty in February 1917. They saw the provisional government as bourgeois, a government to be overthrown as soon as possible. The broadening of that government in May to a coalition of liberals and moderate socialists made no difference to that analysis. The Russian anarchists first came to prominence in May 1917 with the campaign for a people's militia. Famously, in February 1917, the first Prime Minister of the Provisional Government, Prince Lvov, abolished the Tsarist police and put nothing in its place. Popular militias sprung up everywhere. By May, the Provisional Government had decided that the time had come for the popular militias to be professionalised and turned into a regular police force. This reform met with no resistance in the better-off districts of Petrograd but was deeply resented in working-class districts, for it meant disarming the working-class militias, which had sprung up spontaneously during the February Revolution. The anarchists took the lead in the campaign to maintain a people's militia, a campaign run from the headquarters in the working-class district of Viborg, where they had expropriated the mansion of the hated former Minister of the Interior, Peter Durnovo. Although anarchists and Bolsheviks acted in tandem against the provisional government, the anarchists saw themselves as being in the vanguard. The Bolsheviks followed their lead in the People's Militia campaign, and in the next two clashes with the provisional government, the anarchists took the more militant stance. Thus, when on 18th June the provisional government sanctioned an unarmed demonstration, the Bolsheviks marched unarmed with the slogans, down with the provisional government, all power to the Soviets, while the anarchists insisted on carrying guns despite the ban. Then, 
During the July days, when it looked as if popular protest might overthrow the provisional government, the Bolsheviks drew back when they sensed that they lacked the support of the army. But the anarchists established an insurrectionary committee and called for insurrection even as the provisional government arrested Trotsky and sent Lenin into hiding. After July, the Petrograd anarchists, just like the Bolsheviks, concentrated their efforts on the factory committee movement. Despite the continuing efforts of the provisional government to disarm all but its official police force, many factories had retained their Red Guard militias. Anarchists and Bolsheviks worked in local Soviets to protect these militias, and then, when at the end of August General Kornilov tried to stage his military coup, they used those militias to defend the revolution. With Kornilov defeated and Kerensky's provisional government in disarray, anarchists and Bolsheviks looked forward to the Second Congress of Soviets taking power. The anarchist Yefim Yarchuk played an active role in the Military Revolutionary Committee which organised the October insurrection. Anarchists worked with the Bolsheviks in overthrowing Kerensky, but they also believed that the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, would only truly signify the victory of Labour when the political party aspiring to power liquidates itself after victory and yields its place effectively to a free self-government of workers. On the eve of October, the anarchist press analysed the political situation in this way. Kerensky offered the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. The generals, like Kornilov, defended the landowners and the Bolsheviks represented the workers. Faced with the dictatorship of the landowners or the bourgeoisie, we temporarily support the dictatorship of the proletariat. However, if the Bolshevik party seized all political authority for itself, the anarchists declared then, after a more or less prolonged interruption, the struggle will inevitably be renewed they will begin a third and last stage of the Russian Revolution. As Paul Average showed many years ago, one of the first clashes between anarchists and Bolsheviks after October came with the issue of workers' control. Factory committees had been trying to resist factory closures throughout the autumn. They hoped a Bolshevik government would give them immediate support. Some support did come, but the Bolshevik decision to open peace talks put the future of the whole military-industrial complex under threat. In these circumstances, the Bolsheviks wanted coordinated activity from factory committees and were prepared to devise strategies to enforce this. Anarchists argued that workers' control meant workers' control and were determined to resist Bolshevik status centralisation. By the end of December, the anarchists wrote of stagnation, of how the Soviets were becoming little more than organs of central power in the localities, and that the revolution was ossifying. By mid-January 1918, the anarchist voice of Labour declared that the only road which will lead the present social revolution to full victory was to move from a Congress of Soviets to a Federation of Communes. Thus there had already been some talk that the time was approaching for a third revolution, when the brest crisis broke. The decision to sign a peace treaty with Imperial Germany split the Bolshevik party. It also split the left socialist revolutionary party with which the Bolsheviks ruled in coalition. It did not divide the anarchists. They remained 100% opposed to dealings of any kind with imperialists. Sevlod Eichenbaum summed it up in his reminiscences. The Treaty of brest signified for the first time that the dictatorship of the proletariat had won over the proletariat. For the first time, Bolshevik power succeeded in terrorising the masses, in substituting its will for theirs, in acting on its own. The anarchist press proudly proclaimed that the present revolution, the social revolution, the liberator of labourers from all countries is only just beginning. The German challenge should be accepted and the fate of the revolution put directly, frankly, in the hands of the proletariat of the whole world. 
and this meant partisan warfare against the Germans, for the anarchist opposed on grounds of principle the Bolshevik decision to establish the Red Army as a regular standing army. The anarchist viewpoint was expressed with greatest clarity on 3rd March in the editorial of the newspaper Anarchia. Form anarchist fighting brigades, stand under the militant black banner, it declared, urging that, with the Russian bourgeoisie defeated, it was now the turn of the European bourgeoisie. Anarchist fighting brigades would turn the Russian Revolution into a European Revolution, with or without the Bolsheviks. The immediate consequence of the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was the decision to move the capital of Soviet Russia from Petrograd to Moscow. Lenin arrived there on 10th March and Trotsky on the 16th. The Bolshevik leadership arrived at the height of an anarchist-inspired campaign to address the chronic housing shortage in Moscow by seizing the mansions of the rich. The Moscow Anarchist Federation had seized the former Merchants Club as its headquarters and encouraged other anarchist groups to follow suit. By the beginning of April, 26 mansions were in anarchist hands. Some, like that of Alexander Vilenkin, a friend of the British diplomat Bruce Lockhart, were shared with the former owner. Vilenkin recalled that he lived on in his old room, while downstairs there was a machine gun placed in the stairwell under the banner declaring, Anarchy is the mother of order. The Mansion campaign meant that the Moscow anarchists were already involved in direct action as the capital's administrative apparatus was transferred to the city. That direct action had involved the formation of small armed groups, but the need to respond to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk called for something far more organised. When it met on 7th of March, the Moscow Anarchist Federation called for the immediate formation of a Black Guard. Although it would be based around the long-established factory groups, it would have a much clearer formal structure. There would, for example, be a training department, a technical department, an intelligence department, and a quartermaster commission would ensure supplies of arms and food. The Federation condemned the earlier crude forms of struggle against the counter-revolution. In future, all Black Guard actions were to be signed off by the Black Guard staff. It was at this moment that Lieutenant Colonel Mikhail Muravyov came onto the scene. Like many army commanders, Muravyov became an SR after February 1917. In the summer, he was known for his jangling spurs and friendship with the British academic Bernard Pears. But unlike most SR officers, he then moved swiftly to the left and joined the left SRs in October. As a left SR with military experience, he was appointed by the Military Revolutionary Committee to see off the attempt by Cossacks to overthrow the newly established Soviet government as October turned to November. This success made him the ideal choice to lead the war against the nationalist government in Ukraine. And in early February 1918, his forces captured Kiev, just as the nationalists invited the German army to occupy Ukraine. Muravyov and his Ukrainian Red Army fought on, ably assisted by anarchists like Marussia Nikiforova. Muravyov briefly counterattacked and held the Germans back at the Bakhmut railway junction on 15th March, but then was forced to retreat. When he arrived in Moscow on 22nd March, he was given a hero's welcome by those opposed to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, especially the anarchists. A few days later, he approached the leadership of the Black Guard. Muravyov wanted to continue the fight against the Germans. His own party, the left SRs, was split on the matter, although the majority opposed the treaty. However, while fighting the Germans in Ukraine, Muravyov had become friendly with the commander of his armoured car, who was an anarchist. This commander informed Muravyov on 12th March that he intended to join the Black Guard once he got back to Moscow, and it seems Muravyov fell under his influence. Although historians have to rely on rather questionable police route interrogation reports, it is clear that on 25th March, Muravyov informed the Black Guard leadership that he was ready to transfer the men under his command to the Black Guard. The exact figures involved are disputed, but Muravyov's battle-hardened troops would have transformed Moscow's urban militia into a credible fighting force. 
On 4th April, the Secretariat of the Black Guard made clear that its members should prepare to move to the front. It was this decision which prompted the Bolsheviks to take their action against the anarchists on the night of 11th, 12th April. It was this decision which prompted the Bolsheviks to take their action against the anarchists on the night of 11th, 12th April. All 26 mansions were surrounded, their defenders disarmed and 500 militants arrested. Although Pravda wrote of an insurrectionary plot and his vestio wrote of banditry, the real reason was the threat the Black Guard posed to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and the fact that the German ambassador to Soviet Russia would arrive in Moscow in a fortnight's time. Average hinted as much in two rather offhand comments. He noted that at this time the anarchists moved beyond the irritating verbal assaults and were beginning to present a more tangible danger. And as the Black Guard was established, partly in preparation for anticipated guerrilla war against the Germans. The anarchists had to be stopped from wrecking the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and so the Bolsheviks acted. A final note. When George Hill wrote his memoirs in the late 1920s, he asked rhetorically, whatever happened to Marussia Nikiforova, the anarchist beauty he claimed tried to seduce him. He was clearly unaware that she was captured by the Whites in 1919 and executed. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies, for over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.